Hello and welcome to the second episode of Last Chess Week tonight. My name is Fiona Steilantony and I'm your host for the night. And we have two great guests with us tonight. Uh, the first one, I'm so excited to have her on and let's bring bring her on without much further ado. It's one Grandmaster Jennifer Shahadi. Jennifer, how are you tonight? Hey, I'm good. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, guys. Hi. It's such a pleasure having you. I've known you for a few years and I was so delighted when you said yes, because I know you're keeping very, very busy. Uh, de well, you're always keeping busy, but I feel especially these days. So tell us, what have you been up to lately? Well, the U.S. championships just ended, so that's been big, and, you know, it's just a crazy time in the United States, so, you know, um, I've been staying at home, but very, very busy. The girls' program I'm doing, the women's program I'm doing at U.S. Chess takes up a lot of my time, so, yeah, just between that and, like, commentary um, and, you know, just promoting various projects, I have a lot of work, but it's just weird, like, I guess you um, are have been involved in streaming for for a long time, but mm -hmm. I I find it strange to be so busy without leaving the house. It's kind of weird. It's this very strange time, um, but yeah, I think we're sort of the lucky ones that that we can keep busy um, without without leaving the house uh, too much. So a lot of the topics you just brought up are on our agenda for tonight. So we are going to talk about the elections. We are going to talk about the recently concluded uh, US championships. And of course, I'm also looking forward uh, to getting your take on uh, the Queen's Gambit, which has been so uh, such a hot topic lately. Everyone is talking about it. But let's start, uh, start off. I don't know if you can see uh, the images, but I've picked out uh, the two images for your uh, your podcasts. Uh, so you have two podcasts. One of them is a let me just one of them is a chess podcast, the Ladies Night, and the other one is a poker podcast because you're not just, of course, a great chess player and commentator, but uh, you have also been a poker pro for the longest time. So. Tell us a bit about the, the two podcasts. Well, yeah, I've got two podcasts, like you said, about one about poker and one about chess. But in a way, I feel like the poker one, The Grid, is kind of like a chess-inspired podcast. And we've even had none other than Peter Spindler on the show. So that was a big favorite among chess and poker players. So the idea is that like, poker is kind of converging into chess in some weird ways. Because for many years, poker was study it as kind of a very empirical way like people would just like play hands and then they would like talk to their friends about those hands and then they would like, kind of like collect information based on you know experiences and write it down and now it's like very different it's like really really dominant for people to study poker in almost the exact same way we study chess so usually large databases kind of like perfecting their opening ranges, which would be like openings for us, and then perfecting their end game strategy would be like what to do when you don't have a lot of big blinds or when the pots get really shallow. So um, the podcast is like in a way an homage to that in that we're kind of flattening all the possible poker hands and I get one person to discuss each hand. It would be kind of like similar if you had a chess podcast and you had somebody take like a different square on the board, you know, and you did 64 episodes. Yeah. <laughs> and tell me, I'm curious, and you've been very humble about the grid, but I saw that at the Global Poker, Poker Awards, it actually it won a podcast of the year, so it's been very, very well received. I'm curious, how about, you mentioned you had Peter Swidler on, I also think you had some other uh, poker players who are big chess enthusiasts, but how do you feel, do you feel there's been a development that more poker players are getting into chess, or how has that been in your view? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think a lot of that is because they think that because chess players study in this way, maybe they'll get some insights on how to study poker. Um, and then also it's just because chess is booming, so it's just like a fad. In the, for the poker players, like they're like everybody is kind of like interested in learning it because now it's like so popular that it's become trendy in, in poker. Um, 
so yeah, so many of the high stakes players are doing it. Um, Fedor Holt, even Daniel Negreanu played this match on chess.com a couple of years ago you with me and the Brie. The hand and so, brain match, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Liv's a really pretty good chess player. And yeah. I, we, we met her together back in Isle of Man. Yeah, Isle of Man, yeah. It's yeah. Like a long time ago. Time flies. <laughs> I know, like four or five years yeah. ago, right? Absolutely. Yeah, no, so that's really interesting. And the, so the ladies' night... Um, what's the angle there with the with the podcast? It's the, I guess, they're shining the focus on women, women players, and women involved in chess. Yeah, yeah, that that one is about women in chess, and it's part of the U.S. Chess Federation suite of podcasts. So recently, we had Irina Crush on, and she was great. So we always have like a chess champion or somebody from like the world of poker or chess. Um, on chess, really. We haven't had any poker players in that, but we always have somebody, like, who is um, influential in chess, but not always a player. So sometimes, like, an organizer or a writer or something like that. You just uh, mentioned Irina Kurs, so let's move on to uh, to the next topic, which is you already brought it up, the, the recently concluded uh, U.S. championships, which for the first time, of course, there is a pandemic going on, so... Uh, it wasn't possible to have it played over the board in St. Louis, uh, but it was a great event online. It was a lot of fun following it online. Uh, the, the dream team, the St. Louis commentary dream team was reunited with yourself, uh, Maurice and Yasser. And uh, of course, there were some special moments. So I, I found this picture with Dorsa, who had a great event with her cat. So how was the experience different commentating online and everything being online compared to previous years? Oh, well, you know, Irina um, just had a wonderful result. And as for the suite of events, so we covered five events. Um, it was grueling. It was a lot of work, um, but every event had its like own personality and I really felt like it kept just getting more and more dramatic with each one. I loved it. I, I thought each, I thought the events were fantastic. Um, the, the junior, the junior girls, the seniors, and you know, usually Maurice Yasser and I don't get to call the seniors or the juniors mm -hmm. and the junior girls. And that was really cool because I actually really like calling events with players that I don't usually get to call because I think it's just fun. There's all these new people and, you know, you get to interview new people and they're sometimes like a little bit more um, shy because they haven't been interviewed as much. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really fun. So yeah, it, it was great. They were all fantastic. And the final one, I didn't think we could stop top the women's championship because Irina's win was so emotive, but the final one was also insanely like interesting with um, Wesley getting so many points. Just, it, it was very remarkable. Yeah, I mean, 9 out of 11 was a huge, huge score. Um, but we'll, actually, I, I'm going to discuss that one at the open one with Eric Rosen, who will be my next guest later on. So I decided I'll discuss that with him. This one, so I picked uh, Irina. Irina, who, of course, you know her so well. You are yourself a two-time uh, US champion, and she won a record eight title. She this year got uh, ill with the coronavirus so how how was it for you to be commentating you know on a, a record uh, a title and uh, how much do you know did it mean to her actually that's not a record yet she, she needs um 10 will be nine will be tied with the record and 10 will be the record I thought she was tying already no so she needs one more thank you for correcting Good, me. Gisela Grasser but okay um I just thought it was amazing I'm friends with Irina and I've just been in awe of how she's kind of like reacted to this horrible, horrible case of coronavirus that she got. Like she got a really bad one. And, you know, she's revealed to me both on ladies night and also in the interviews with like me and Yaz and Maurice that like she really thought she might die at some point. Right. Like it's quite clear, you know, like and she said, even when she played in isolated Queens, I think the event that you played in mm -hmm. um, that she thought, you know, okay, if, like, I'm not going to live that much longer, at least I'm able to, like, do this and, like, enjoy it. And, okay, she didn't use those exact words, but, you know, she was very uh, 
uh, really very faced with her mortality because, you know, uh, bad cases of coronavirus. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky that I haven't gotten it yet, but this bad case of COVID really attacks your ability to breathe. So after that, though, she seemed to take it like in such a philosophical way to kind of, you know, just live life to the fullest and kind of like um, try to improve herself and like reconsider different things in her life. So I, I really admired her. And then when she won the event, including some just some really nice games, um, I was really happy for her. I actually I found this uh, GIF of her on uh, on Twitter uh, where she I think this was after the final round where she got the title and you can see her you know uh, fit both fists up in the air and you can really really see how much uh, how much this title meant to her and, and I, I like to see the, the evolution we've had uh, in online chess you know because at first you'd think well you only really get those emotions over the board but I think with online chess we've also been treated you know with the cameras now um we've been treated to some great great shots yes especially for the women because they're very polite mm -hmm. um and good, they have great manners a lot mo for the most part so like you were not going to see this in an over the board like because you'd feel like it was rude to Emily Mm -hmm. But when it's like on the camera, it doesn't really feel rude because the person like doesn't have to watch if they don't want to. But if you're like right in front of them doing that, like I personally think that it's okay to show emotion over the board. But I know that a lot of people are reserved because they don't think it's polite. So yeah, that's actually a weird kind of asset to online chats that you wouldn't think of. Actually, can you see the poker too? <laughs> like, in, like in poker, if I win a hand and like somebody folds to my bluff, I, I might like fist pump and say like, yes, you know, I would never in a million years do that in a live tournament, you know, I, yeah. so rude. I completely understand. Actually, speaking of your poker, I know that you also created a Twitch, uh, a Twitch account, but as far as I've seen, you mostly have streamed uh, Twitch, uh, you have mostly streamed poker to Twitch. Are you planning to stream uh, some chess or more chess as well? Or what are your plans with your Twitch channel? Well, I was, when I was doing Twitch, I was mostly doing poker and chess at the same time, actually. Um, but so I guess depending on which one was more dominant, um, we would pick the category. By the way, Che Doc, who's on the Twitch chat, helped me <laughs> enormously with my, uh, with my stream. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know. I, would, I, like, I think my favorite thing was playing poker and then going over great chess games at the same time. I liked that because... When I tried to play chess and poker at the same time, I found it difficult to play a time control that would, you know, um, be suitable. Like, I would just, like, sometimes lose on time because I'd be playing a real important money game in the poker, and then I just would just lose so many games on time. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting concept, actually. Are you planning, are you planning more of it, or are you too busy at the moment, or...? You know, I, I liked it, but I also feel like some of the, I've kind of gotten more clarity in recent um, months with like what I need to spend my time on. And I really like to spend my time on things where I feel like there's like a lot of growth potential for me. And I just felt like Twitch was not, like it's really fun and it's a good way to directly interact with fans and friends. So I definitely do it like for fun once in a while, but I, I don't see me trying to do it as a sideline because it's, it's very saturated. So I think that if you want to, I, I just think I have more high equity ways to use, mm -hmm. spend my time, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, I think you kind of, it's to use a poker metaphor, I think to be successful, you kind of want to go all in, right? <laughs> and the Twitch game is a long grind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's move on to another topic, which became even more topical. I didn't, uh, I didn't realize until shortly before we went live. But I think as we speak, Hikaru is doing a, a stream where he's raising uh, his. I don't know if it's a campaign event, but it's a stream in support of Joe Biden. And you have also been very uh, outspoken on the matter. Uh, so tell me, well, first of all, is it the first time that you are so outspoken on the topic? So previous ele elections, what was your position and why did you decide uh, to come out so much in support of the Biden-Harris uh, campaign? I think I've been, 
spoken somewhat outspoken, but definitely less. Like, I'm sure, you know, because I, four years ago, I thought, honestly, I thought Hillary was going to win for sure. So I would, like, post a photo, because at the time I was pregnant. So I posted photos, like, of me voting with, like, Fabi in my belly and, like, you know, I, that, that's my son's name for those who are watching and don't know. So I was like, yeah, I was like uh, posting about it. But obviously, I feel like the stakes are a lot higher because back then I was wrong. I well, I mean, I thought that the chances of Trump winning were very low. Um, and so clearly I was totally wrong about that. And this year I I um, realized, you know, after four years of Trump that if we have um, more time with him in the White House, um, I I think that um, our democracy might collapse mm-hmm. as, you know, right voting rights are already really under a lot of fire. And I think that um, this might be the last election, the last fair election that we get to vote in if Trump wins. So we got to try to do everything we can to get him out of office. And I think it's a moral imperative um, for me to speak out I mean, I'm not sure um, how much it helps because usually the people who repost like that are already on my side or aggressively against it. But I still think it's like an important model, you know, to show other people that if they have a platform, that it's a good time to use it because I don't think there's anything that's really more important right now than getting him out of the White House. He just already killed so many people with the COVID-19. I mean, yeah, absolutely. he's underestimating the threat, not wearing a mask himself as the commander in chief. I mean, it's just shameful. Um, so many of the things did not refusing to disavow white supremacy. I mean, like that was like, that was like actually like another one where I was just like, I, I don't know if he can get any lower. Like I, I can't even imagine it, but in 2020, you just, you just see these new things and it becomes like the new normal and that's not right. I mean, that's not America. I think it's absolutely. I mean, I was very happy to see you and to see other people, you know, who have big flat platforms. I think it's absolutely so important to speak up when you have the chance to, to reach out to people. But of course, with big platforms uh, and topics, you know, that like the situation seems so tense right now in the United States. And I've uh, pulled up this other stream. I think this was just from earlier today or yesterday. Of course, when you speak out, there's always gonna be, uh, there's always gonna be backlash. And so I saw this tweet of someone uh, tweeting at you saying, why are you bringing politics into chess? Chess is far too majestic to be embroiled into the dirty world of politics. So what do you have to say to, you know, all the people uh, who say, oh, don't bring this, don't bring this into chess or don't talk about politics. Um, yeah, well, I don't agree with that at all. I think the thing about chess is that it's a tool for you to d- use critical thinking um, and to try to think independently and be able to focus and think for yourself and decide what's the biggest priorities in life. So I, I think it's actually like chess players of all people should be like very anxious to speak out. So I, I just I have a totally different reading of it, but I'm not surprised. You know, people are often wanting, um, you know, women or influential women um, to shut up, you know, if they don't like what they're saying. So, yeah, I'm not surprised. I, I'm getting it all the time now. Like, you know, don't talk about this. Don't talk about that. Well, you know. I always when I watch your social media I like I look up to you in that I feel like it doesn't you know it doesn't reach you and you always I, I really like how you get back to people calmly even if, if they attack you if like it always feels that your way of arguing with people and discussing um yeah, it really is something I really look up to. And uh, I especially, I forgot to pull out that that tweet, but you did an April, Fool, an April Fool's tweet this year, which backfired a little bit, right? Oh, yeah, that was that was not, that wasn't the best one, although it was one of my most popular tweets ever. I, I, I you know, I had an April Fool's tweet that, um, you know, Trump was doing a pretty good job. Um, I had to admit that he was doing a pretty good job with like, uh, I can't remember what it was, but he wasn't doing a good job with anything. Maybe it was the uh, 
coronavirus like relief economic relief package or something um and it was it was an april fool's joke but like 90 percent of the people not 90 percent, but like about half of the people thought that it was real Mm -hmm. and um so they were like all pissed off that it was like they thought they I, that I was, I was, you know, a Trump supporter after all this time. And I was like, finally admitting it. It just, yeah, I, it, I learned a big lesson from that. I think, you know, since then, of course, I've been more vocal with the election approaching. So I think that people would be more likely to understand I was joking. But still, you got to be really careful with sarcasm and social media. Of course. Because people aren't going to read sarcasm very well. Yeah. Um, we especially... All- Especially yeah, sure. not known for being funny. Mm-hmm. Like I'm known for a lot of things, but like humor is not high up there. So if I if I'm like putting out all these tweets about like all this great stuff I'm doing, fun transpositions, like you know streams, you know books that I'm reading, and then all of a sudden I put like a joke, like that's confusing to people because I'm not a comic, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Social media is not always easy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like we're learning something, something new uh, every day. And Jen, let's move on to a somewhat lighter topic. Uh, I mentioned it earlier. Of course, it is uh, the Queen's Gambit. So I already discussed the Queen's Gambit a little bit with Simon Williams last week. He was a big fan. And with you, I wanted to come at it uh, from another angle. Well, first of all, Uh, Of course, I'd love to to hear your thoughts uh, on the series, but I saw that you and amongst others, Olympia Urkan, um, raised the point, and I'll I'll let you elaborate, but something of a missed uh, opportunity. Oh, yeah. Well, I thought it was fantastically done, and the chess scenes were so beautiful and sumptuous and... Anya and the younger girl who played her younger self were just like so good at capturing like the chess player's mental state and the struggle and triumph. Um, I did notice a couple of things. A uh, shout out, by the way, to Bruce Pandolfini and Gary Kasparov because they did a really good job picking out chess positions and making the chess realistic. But there were a couple of things that um, I felt were missed opportunities. Um, and one of them was that, just from a writing perspective, Beth never really played any female opponents except for one in, like, the very first tournament, which I thought was a little odd because, yeah, I mean, it's trying to show that she's, like, an exception and that she's, like, a complete genius, and that's great. Like, and the idea of a fe- the image of a female genius and that beautiful mind is wonderful, but re- re- really, like, zero other girls or women the entire series, that felt a little bit extreme. Although I understand what they were trying to do from a stylistic point of view. Um, and then also I found out from uh, Olympia's article, because I'm not really eagle eyed with details, honestly, mm-hmm. but I found out from his article that none of the examples in the show were from female players. And I was like, oh, that's such a missed opportunity, especially because Judith Polgar like, has this flaming red hair. So that would have been like such a cool Easter egg for people who got more into chess from the film to like Google the games and then see that it was like a Judith game. And that's not, that's like not something that's on the surface. Like you'd have to dig it. But yeah, I I did think like, that's a great point. And it just goes to show you how important it is to have like, you know, feminist thought. And because sometimes things like that, you're just like, Oh, it's so obvious, but you only notice it once somebody tells you. And how did you feel that Beth's experience in the Queen's Gambit compared to uh, to your experience, maybe growing up, you know, in in the chess circles, how does does did it compare to real life for you? I thought they nailed a lot of things really well, um, like the the as much as they could, because obviously it's a it's a series, so they they're not going to have people move at the same pace, and like there's gonna there's gonna be talking during the game sometimes, like all that stuff. I thought was totally great. I'm not really a stickler for accuracy, honestly, when it comes to chess films and and in series, whatever they did, it worked really well. Um, obviously, like, the drugs and alcohol um, was interesting because I, I, I feel like there was a time in chess where that was more prevalent. Like, people like to go to tournaments and party and have fun at night. And it still happens, but I think at the highest level, it's pretty rare. Mm-hmm. So um, the way the series portrayed it was very strange, though, because usually that would be, like, 
a way to recover from a tough tournament or a tough game. Yeah. Whereas they actually showed it as a way that you got inspired to see the chess pieces better, which is like total BS. And I, I understand again, it's artistic license to make the, the series more dramatic, but yeah, that, that was a little troublesome for somebody who's trying to promote chess to girls. Cause I know they can't watch the series now and that's really sad. You know, especially with pills, you know, pills are like the worst. Yeah. Because people are like dropping dead because of pills. It's, it's and in those years, I don't think it was as bad. Like you wouldn't drop dead from like taking a pill because there wasn't like the widespread use of fentanyl, right? Like that, like it is now, but yeah, it's pretty bad. Do you think we will see an increase in, in young girl players and women players thanks to the, the Queen's Gambit or... Do you think it's just sort of a trend and it will pass? I think so. I'm not, I feel like it's more maybe women and um, teens because, like, it is a bit problematic for girls. So I think parents are kind of, you know, keeping it away from their kids to some extent. Uh, prob not because of, like, the sex or the alcohol, but I just that those pills, man. You know, everybody in America now knows somebody who died because of, like, a you know, opioid overdose. So the last thing you want is your kid to think that it's going to let you become like a grandmaster. Mm -hmm. um, but and maybe women, and that's good because if more women play the game or more teenagers play the game, that's role models for the kids, right? Because that's what we always have in U.S. chats, for instance. We've got like a big group of like five to 11-year-olds and then they drop out. So I feel like this series will kind of encourage people who are a little older, who are mature enough to understand like all the themes of the series. And that's really exciting. Well, we're talking broadly about promoting uh, chess for women, something you have been doing for a long, long time. So you are, we talked about it here, a chess player, a chess commentator, poker player, but you're also an author and uh, you wrote a long time ago by now, Chess Bitch, Women in the Ultimate Intellectual Sport, and then later Play Like a Girl. So tell us a bit uh, what those books are about and what you, you had in mind, what you wanted to achieve uh, when you wrote them. Well, both of them, I wanted to achieve the same thing, to kind of show the positive aspects of women and girls in the game. And in Play Like a Girl, it was by using chess tactics and checkmates by top female players and chess bitch it was all about stories of top female players interwoven with my own story as in my professional chess years um so yeah that that was the concept for both of them and i'm i'm really i'm really happy because even today i kind of feel the same way that the best way to counter negativity and you know criticism is with positivity mm -hmm. so not by trying to argue with people as much as trying to show them examples of women who are awesome in the game you know and that's what i try to do with both of those books for sure and uh, you are still doing that uh these days it's not just you didn't just write these days you are still so active among others uh with us uh women chess and uh, so that brings us to co what's coming up next uh, with you before we move on to the questions. But uh, the U.S. Chess Federation has this playlist and you do, I think it's, is it weekly uh, sessions? Tell us, tell us all about it. Yeah. That. So I have a girls club at U.S. Chess and, you know, before the pandemic, we met at major events mm -hmm. and now we moved to Zoom, of course, and it's booming. Um, we've got hundreds of girls in the club and, um, weekly sessions, sometimes twice a week, actually. We have, we have like once a week on a regular time and then we have special events. Like we have a Kenya and US Chess Girl Exchange program, which is really awesome. We have like a special events for teens. And speaking of the Queen's Gambit, we have a huge guest coming next week. Gary Kasparov is coming to talk about one of the games he consulted for on the series. That is simply um, incredible. Yes, and we recently had Irina talk about her eighth win. So, yeah, we, we have a lot of fun. We had um, Greg, my brother. He was the only other male guest except for Gary so far. But I, I mentioned... Two big your... names. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, Greg, yeah, I had to... 
after you, I had to go with Gary. <laughs> but no, seriously, um, he talked about um, how he uses Chessable to get better at opening. So I, I thought I'd mention that since we're on the Chess24 channel. Absolutely. They should all go. Well, go and check out, first of all, the, the YouTube channel and uh, the Chessable courses, of course. And so that's that's coming up. This When is this... Um, can, so what happens? People cannot watch it live, but they can rewatch it, or what, how does it work? Yeah, we we do it. We do like it to be like an experience. So it's not a stream. It's a Zoom um, class, and people we basically create a video of, of it afterward and try to like cut out all the. Are you off mute? Are you muted, Stan? And then <laughs> and then we uh, just kind of give them the experience of being there. Um, it's great because the girls really make friends from it. Uh, I keep the chat open and sometimes we do breakout rooms. So a lot of them have become friends and it's really great to see because sometimes there's just not a lot of girls who play chess in the, the, the city that you're from. Mm -hmm. So this has allowed us to kind of create a network and I'm super excited about it. I think it's such a great thing and I, I really, uh, I wish that all the others would follow, follow the lead. I heard someone is, by the way. I, I read an article in the FIDE newsletter about Lauren um, DaCosta. Is that right? I, I think I knew my I haven't oh. read it yet. You're putting me on the spot. I, I, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. He's from the UK. Um, no, I know who he is, but I haven't heard of... So you tell us. What's he going to be? Well, I know he's he was... Doing... He's doing a girls club in the UK and it sounded kind of like, you know, similar to what I'm doing in that he gets a bunch of girls together and they study chess games of great female players and such. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's great. I mean, the, the thing is, I, I actually consulted with somebody from like a smaller country about it and I, I suggested maybe creating a network of a few different countries because if you, like the population was in like the low millions, I th actually, I think it's even lower. Um, the problem is if you don't have a critical mass, then yeah. it's hard because the whole concept is for the girls to make friends with each other. So you need like a critical mass. And so America is such a big country, it's perfect for us. Because, you know, I can get like hundreds, hundreds of girls and then even if only 100 or 50 show up, that's like a really good group. But Zoom is like very different in that way. Like in person, sometimes you like something that's smaller, right? Because mm -hmm. everybody likes to meet and people like small groups because they're like spaces at a premium. Online, it really shifts that like, it's almost like the bigger, the better. Yeah, it's I a can, weird thing. I can completely relate to what you're saying. And I really hope that smaller countries really get together because when I see I'm from Luxembourg, for example, like we couldn't do anything, you know, like when we have a training session, even before the Olympiad, even if it's open to more women, we're lucky to have, you know, five, five women players. So I hope, I hope that uh, people will, will listen and to see what's being done and, um, I really hope also now that with the Queen's Gambit and everything that's happening, that uh, that we will we'll see more young girls and more. Uh, also, I think girls who are, you know you know girls or women, uh, I think it's uh, it would be good for them to see you know the chess world is not the scary world that they cannot enter at a, a later stage or something like that. Totally. And I think that, you know, the thing is a lot of moms might watch the series and they might not show the series to their daughters, but they might still teach chess to their daughters and kind of push them more or, or dads. So I think that, uh, yeah, it's definitely going to be really fantastic for the game. The thing is the, the, the show really kind of gives us the beauty of over the board chess. Mm -hmm. So that's like the only missing piece for this COVID to end so that we can play over the board as well as online because they're the perfect pairing. Only having one is not the same as having both. Like you, you really want both because um, some kids and parents just like want that live experience and it's something that they can control a little bit more than having their kid on, on Twitch or on streaming. Um, so I, I uh, can't wait for that to happen because then I think really everything will like take off and well, like I said, step one is um, getting. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. I mean, online chess is great and everything that's happening, but it will never replace, you know, sitting at the board and sitting opposite your opponent. Uh, Jen, I have some quick fire questions prepared for you. I don't know if you want, if there's anything else you want to tell us for what else is coming up for you. Um, if not, I will, I will uh, put you on the spot with some quick fire questions. Yeah, go ahead. I love them. And meanwhile, if people who are watching us in the chat, either on on Twitch, on YouTube, ha uh, on YouTube, have any questions for Jennifer now is your chance uh, after after the quick fire questions i will open the floor to you guys so any questions now is your chance so the first bunch of questions are general so they're not related to chess and then later on there will be some chess related questions okay so first off if you could be an animal what would you be um a giraffe and what superpower would you like to have flying um, what is the strangest thing you have ever eaten? Um, hmm. I definitely had shark fin soup. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't, I, that, that's all I can think of right now. I actually, I, I forgot to say as well, I gave them last week, I told them you can have one pass on one question. Uh, so you get that. If you had a time machine, where and when would you go? Where would I go? Um, and which era, sort of which place and which time? But I don't get to change anything in this time machine. Just get to kind of like hang out. I would go kind of far back because I think that would be like the most interesting, right? How far um, back? Well, you know, maybe Philadelphia, like during the Declaration of Independence or something like that. I kind of would love to see the way like my great city looked, you know, hundreds of years ago. Very interesting. Yeah. There was someone, by the way, in the YouTube chat who recognized your accent or thought they recognized uh, your accent. So you are a Philadelphia girl. Yeah, yeah, I'm a Philly, Philly person. I mean, there's so many good answers, but you have to go way back because it has to be something that you can't, you, there's no existing video for because that would be like the most interesting because you can't see it, sure. right? Video gives us like such a great approximation of what it would be like. Absolutely, yeah, for sure it would be very interesting. Now for something else, which three people would you invite to dinner? Um, living people? Uh, living or dead? Oh, definitely dead then. It has to be all dead people, um, <laughs> if I'm given the choice. <laughs> so who would they be? Um, well, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hmm. Should I pick a chess person? Vera Menchik, Sonia Graf, Sonia. No, I pick Sonia. Sonia was insane. She was so cool. You know, she was an anti-Nazi. And if it wasn't for the Olympiad and Buenos Aires during the start of the war, she would have um, probably been killed by the Nazis, right? Because okay. there were people who spit her profile. She was like the vice world champion um, after Vera Menchik for many years, and. There were a lot of people who fit her profile who were, were killed in World War II, but she ended up living in Buenos Aires and then finally in the United States and just one of the most fascinating chess players out there. Um, okay, so I've got a chess player. So I've got, got Jesus, Jesus, Sonia. <laughs> Who's gonna and, be um, yeah, some, somebody fun. Oh, my God. I guess maybe I should bring, um, like, uh, some amazing singer back to life like Amy Winehouse. <laughs> that sure would be a fun dinner party. Uh, Jennifer, describe yourself in three words. Um, energetic. Um, moody. Mm -hmm. Very moody. Um, and um, creative. Interesting, interesting. The next one is a bit easier. Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram? Um, well, I, I gotta, I gotta go with Twitter because it seems like it's the least evil of the three. Um, that said, follow me on Instagram because I'm, I need ten thousand followers, and I'm at like ninety nine hundred. I'm like, I know, and then you get to swipe up, right? Yes, exactly. I need like a hundred more. So but um, I, I like Twitter the best because I think that you know. 
the owners of Facebook and Instagram are like the same now. And definitely there's more toxicity, I think, based on that. Now, I still think that the platforms have a lot of great value um, for people networking and, and enhancing their careers. So I'm not like a total hater. Like I still have them. I know a lot of people mm-hmm. who deleted their Facebook. I haven't done that. And I'm not really um, like uh, thinking of it right now. But uh, yeah, Twitter seems like the best of the three. And you get to express yourself um, and improve your writing and your humor. Yeah, so people should, well, your Twitter handle is right below your camera. So people should make sure to follow you. And also, of course, on Instagram, let's get down to 10K. Um, (laughs) Your favorite movie? Um, Magnolia. Favorite artist? Well, I'll say Marcel Duchamp. Mm-hmm. Favorite food? Um, sushi. And favorite drink? Uh, gin and tonic, although I've had <laughs> so many of those at the, during the pandemic. <laughs> oh, coffee too. Well, if you're counting coffee, like I, I, that's like number one. Coffee and gin and tonic, not bad. Favorite, <laughs> what was your favorite subject in school? Um, mm, you know, I think it was like English, it depended on the teacher, but English was often my favorite. You studied literature, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And your favorite sport besides chess? My favorite sport besides chess, I shouldn't say poker. Um, I loved to play basketball when I was younger. I never joined the team. I was on the swim team. So I, but I, but now I, I do like watching and just like throwing hoops when I can. And finally, your best quality. Hmm. My best quality. Um, uh, I guess my, um, my work ethic, my, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. No, no, I don't want to say that. Kindness. Kindness. Yeah. I think both, both are (laughs) great, great qualities. Now for the chess themed, uh, the chess themed question. So first of all, which chess opening will you never play? Um, the French. <laughs> Sorry, Greg. I know, I know a lot of people wanted me to say the Scandi, but I actually think it's okay. The French never. <laughs> which chess player would you take with you on a desert island? Uh, which chess player? Oh, God, because my husband doesn't play chess. So this is pretty tricky, guys. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Um, like, I, so now I'm going to pass. That's my pass. <laughs> well, maybe you should have saved it for the Alpha next Zero. Alpha Zero. <laughs> that AI will help me out. That is island. one tricky answer. AI is going to help me out the island, no doubt. That supercomputer. <laughs> My next question was going to be, who do you not want to be stranded with? Who would you not want to be stranded with? Oh, no, that's mean. <laughs> oh, my God. I have to come up with, like, a joke because, um, you know, my previous answer was kindness. Uh. <laughs> Uh, I, I was thinking, I was actually, when I wrote down that question, I thought it was going to be easier to come up with something humorous than I maybe realized. Okay, my brother, because he doesn't know how to make a fire, cut wood, um, he doesn't know how to do any of those outdoors and stuff. I don't either, but that's why together we would be terrible. We wouldn't be getting off that island. Never getting away. What is the one word that describes you as a player? As a, as a chess player? Yeah. Um, aggressive. Aggressive. Uh, classical, rapid, blitz, or bullet? Ca- classical. For, you- me to, to, for me to play as well as possible. To watch, definitely not. <laughs> what do you prefer to watch? Um, rapid. Rapid, probably number one. Maybe blitz is also good, though. And your favorite world champion? My favorite world champion, um, Gary Kasparov. I have like a bit of a recency bias. I'm like Kasparov and then Magnus. <laughs> <laughs> but they're two great world champions. What would you be if you were not a, a chess, 
Well, actually, that doesn't so much apply to you because you don't do so much else. But if you were not involved with chess or poker. I think the writing and writing would be like the one thing that no matter what field I was in, I think I would do that in some way, writer. Okay. And what would you name your opening if you invented one? Um, well, definitely the Shahadi attack. And then I would lord it over my brother that was named after me and not him. <laughs> I love your rivalry on Twitter, the, the friendly, the friendly <laughs> And finally, my last question, your greatest achievement. Um, my greatest achievement, um, winning my two U.S. Women's Championship titles. And um, yeah, I think um, that, that those would be the two biggest ones. And then in poker, some of my various my winning the open face tournament in Prague and also my two books. Okay, so I like your answers. You're not phased by any of the by any of the questions. Um, Jen, the time has flown by so quickly, but there is one question and it's a, it's a poker related question. Can you tell us what it uh, was like to play with Phil Ivey? Oh, well, not great because he beat me in a really important hand. <laughs> But other than that, I it's like the tournament I played with him in, him in was for a million dollars, um, and there was only six of us, so it was like incredibly important. But if it wasn't a million dollar tournament, I would have relished the opportunity to play him because it's like you can learn so much just like in chess from playing against the best in the world. Um, so yeah, any any other stakes, it would be like amazing to play with Phil, but was such a big, big prize fund that was like, give me the weakest player that I can get. And, and then they're like, the last qualifier is Bill Ivey. <laughs> Great. Great. Uh, and a final, final question, just and by the way, that previous question was by Claude. And the last question for you from uh, Shashank. Jen, are you team Scandi or not? Um, I'm going to have to side with my brother and say I'm not Team Scandi, but you never know. I'm definitely more likely to play D5 and E6. Let's put it that way. <laughs> That's what we, we'll take that on away uh, from this. So, Jennifer, uh, thank you so very much uh, for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Tell us, when can we await the, the episode with Gary? Oh, yeah. Well, it, we're going to be doing it next week. So the video edit will probably be like a few days after that. So I'd say like maybe a, a week and a half from now or a week from now. Great. Well, I'm sure looking forward to that. People should make sure to subscribe and, uh, of course, follow you on all the platforms. Jen, thank you so very much uh, for your time and best of luck with everything uh, you have coming up. And fingers crossed for Tuesday, of course. Thank you so much. Great job producing this. Your questions are awesome. And yes, you have one of the other um, nicest chess players at, coming on next. So big shout out to Eric Rosen. And thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Bye bye. Oh. Okay, so Jennifer Shahadi, everyone. And it's been really, really great having her on. We are running a tiny bit late, uh, so I will bring bring on Eric without too much uh, further ado. So let me set Eric up. So we're having two huge names uh, of, of US Jazz with us tonight. Um, I'm really, really glad that they both joined me. Uh, so let me just message Eric and bring him on. Uh, okay, so we'll bring Eric on in a second. We're going to discuss uh, with Eric the US jams just a little bit more, but not too much more since we already heard quite a lot about them. With Eric, our focus is mostly gonna lie on uh, what he has been up to during this pandemic. 
which is he's been super busy, of course, uh, with Twitch, with his YouTube channel. But let's hear it uh, from the man himself. Um, let me. Okay. Eric, people can already hear you. Hey, and, Fiona. Hey. Uh oh. I can't hear you. You can uh, hear me. Okay, wait. Right? Give me one moment. I think my mic setting is a bit off. Can you hear me now? Can you guys hear Eric in the chat? Let me know. Um, it shouldn't be on my end since Jen was able to hear oh, Okay, me. now I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. And in a second, you are not Jen though. You are Eric. So people Oh, yeah. <laughs> should now be able to see you and hear you eric how are awesome. you i'm doing well how are you i'm i'm good i'm uh, i'm excited it's been a it's a busy time i think i was just talking to jen and i think we're some of the lucky few that have been uh, kept very busy during this pandemic Oh, definitely. Yeah. No, I, I liked her quote. I, I caught most of the interview. Uh, she had some some quotes saying she's more or it's it's weird being so busy, but being home all the time, yeah. which I can very much relate to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're all being kept uh, on our toes despite the, the weird time. And I think we're really some of the lucky few where there's almost been an influx of uh, of work and things to do so how have the last you know how's the last year it's almost been a year now how's it been how's it been for you yeah no um i mean time is going really really quickly it seems like since uh since the pandemic really took off in in march um the, the months are kind of meshing together Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm staying busy, spending a lot of time, of course, streaming, doing YouTube, um, trying to maintain some kind of balanced lifestyle and have time outside of chess as well. Um, been playing a decent amount of tennis lately with, uh, with Ray Robson. Okay. Um, so you are doing, based uh, in St. Louis right now, right? I am. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I moved here in April, 2019 mm -hmm. and I actually share an apartment with the chess bras. Um, but they haven't been here for about a year because they're they're <laughs> they also have a place in Canada, so. So you get to place to yourself. Yeah, which is nice. Yeah, it's a it's a nice two bedroom apartment, not too far away from uh, the St. Louis Chess Club. Very um, nice. I just realized you guys are are on Twitch and YouTube, right? Yeah, we are. Yeah. Ah, okay, I'm gonna send a raid then. I should be hosting you guys. That's Even though I'm not live, I should Thank be able to send so some much. people. Perfect. Um, so yeah, so basically everything that we've just talked about during the last minute, we'll talk about uh, in a bit more detail. I'm super curious to hear Eric's thoughts uh, on everything that's been happening with the, the Twitch boom. Thank you, Eric, for the raid. Much appreciated. My pleasure. Yeah, there are, I guess, 25 <laughs> people sitting in my empty chat. So Yeah, that's interesting. I've literally never seen a, a raid from an offline of an on uh, an offline channel. So that's what I mean. I'm hoping uh, very opportunistically that maybe I will even pick up a thing or two tonight um, as we go along. Let me just fix your camera. Uh, perfect. So this brings me to my first question. Uh, just like with Jen, follow Eric as well. Uh, well, follow him everywhere, Twitch, uh, Twitter, but Instagram. Eric, one of your uh, one of your many, just like Jen, you wear so many different hats. Um, but one that I love to follow the most is your photography. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, I think your shots are so great, especially the animal shots. Um, and you used to travel so, so much. Uh, I always saw you on Instagram, you know, all over the place. So how does it feel, first of all, to sort of be in one place now? Uh, and, and when was your last trip? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely uh, been some sense of cabin fever over the last many months. Um, I, I really miss uh, the traveling. Um, I had all these plans to, to go to Vietnam in March for, uh, for this HD Bank tournament. And then I, I wanted to go to Norway for the chess party. 
um, obviously that all fell through and uh, I haven't really been traveling at all. Um, my last trip, I actually went to Israel back in January mm -hmm. uh, for 10 days. It was one of like these free birthright trips. So it wasn't at all chess related, but um, that was my last time traveling internationally. And then before that, I went to, I did like a two week Asia trip last mm -hmm. year. Um, but I am really itching to, to travel again. Also, like, I, I kind of miss your, your travel blogs <laughs> or your, the, the vlogs on, uh, on YouTube. So I'm looking forward to when those come back. Well, th there's actually one in the making right now since I was, uh, I was working at Norway Chess a couple of weeks ago. So mm. there is one still, still in the works. But yeah, of course, we have all been pretty much um, uh, grounded by, by the pandemic. I guess you have no, no travel plans even nationally coming up or is there anything? So I occasionally go back uh, to the Chicago area because um, that's where my family is based. That's where I grew up. So um, every every month or two, I'll make a small trip back to, to see family. But um, uh, most of my time has been spent in St. Louis. So trying to find ways to keep myself entertained. And uh, there's a nice uh, there's forest park near the, the chess club, which I'll, I'll take walks in. Um, I posted an Instagram photo not too long ago of just a nice kind of sunset. The second uh, over the photo street. right there with the water. Yeah, second most recent. Yeah. yeah so, I've never yeah. been to St. Louis, but I, oh, it's really? very high up on my, my to-visit list. Hopefully, after the pandemic, I'll make it work. Uh, before we move on to more chessy uh, subjects, just let me ask you, since also the Instagram account is called Eric Rosen Photography, how did you get into photography? How long has this been a hobby of yours? And also, how does taking photos of travel and food and animals compare to taking photos of chess? And which which do you prefer? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll try and answer the first part of the question. Um, I got into photography around high school. Mm -hmm. uh, I took a, a photography class my freshman year. And um, I, I got really into it. I got like a nice camera shortly after. And then uh, later on in high school, I, I worked for my high school's yearbook and was basically the main sports photographer. So took took photos of all the sports teams. Um, and then in college, I took a bunch of other photo classes. Um, but I'll, I'll probably say that I've learned more about photography from YouTube and just through kind of experience and trial and error than any sort of course. Um, and it's been it's been a nice passion of mine over the years. It's nice to uh, uh, to capture the moment and especially combining it with chess, um, mm -hmm. be able to kind of have another side gig, at least with over the board tournaments to uh, uh, do some journalism. Um, I photographed during the, the world championship match. It's actually the last time I saw you, I think, yeah, in exactly. person. Exactly, I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah, I had a nice spot in the, the media room. I took over the U.S. chess Twitter account. Um, and it's a lot more relaxing taking photos of chess players than actually competing in, in serious tournaments. So it's been a nice outlet. That's something I can definitely, definitely relate to. So yeah, make sure, make sure to check Eric out. And uh, later I'll come back to what you said about, you know, learning from YouTube and tutorials, but let's move on. We've already talked a little bit about the US Gems uh, with Jennifer, but mostly about the women's, uh, women's tournament. In the Open, it was uh, Wesley, all Wesley so this year. He had a dominant performance, uh, finished on nine out of 11. How much uh, did you follow uh, the US Championships this year? And I mean, you live in St. Louis, which is where the tournament usually takes place. So mm. this year it was all uh, online. So was there still something happening in St. Louis during the tournament? Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't believe there is anything like physically happening at the club. I know um, at least when I walk by, they broadcast uh, their their live shows on kind of their, their TV screens in the, the windows. Um, I'll admit I didn't follow it as closely as previous championships. Um, just because with the format, uh, it was like so many games each day and, uh, and my sleep schedule is off uh, over the last week. Uh, it was a bit more difficult to follow than, than usual. But um, I, I did look at, uh, look at the games and it was super impressive, uh, Wellesley's performance. 
Um, and I will say, uh, at least in previous years, Wesley is my favorite, one of my favorite photo or players to photograph. Because mm-hmm. he, um, even when he's like playing a game, he still sometimes poses for the camera. Like it'll be his turn, and then he'll see me taking a photo, then he'll look look up and smile. smile at the so, camera. Um, yeah, it was nice to to see him have uh, such an amazing result. Yeah, and we'll we'll talk a, a bit more about him in a second because you actually alerted me to to his Facebook uh, post, which followed the tournament. But first, I'll pull up uh, Hikau's treat. So this was not Hikau's uh, tournament. I think he went into the tournament as one of the favorites, seeing as. Uh, with the tournament being online and the faster time control definitely uh, and he was understandably not happy with his performance and he tweeted after the tournament if you aren't first you're last <laughs> i never used to think this way but i 100 percent do now um what did you think when you saw hikaru's tweet and how much do you agree with him yeah uh there's different ways to interpret it I mean, there were, there were 12 players, right? Yeah. So, I mean, maybe he meant to say, if you're not first through 11th, then you're last. But, um, of course, like, it, it's, it's different for, for every player. And I think for him especially, like, there's so much pressure being one of the clear favorites mm-hmm. that he's expected to win. And anything short of winning is, is maybe considered a failure. Um, so I know towards the end of the tournament, uh, it was probably discouraging for him having a few tough losses. And then I think he went a little bit crazy, understanding that he was in a must win situation mm. uh, in some of the final rounds. Um, I don't think it applies so much for the other players, um, especially maybe the lower rated ones who are, are still trying to get experience uh, like Sam Sevian or yeah. Eric, so sorry, we just got a huge raid from Penguin, Ooh. raiding with a party hey. of 434. <laughs> so big shout out uh, to Penguin. Thank you so much and welcome to the show. This is Last Jazz Week tonight. It's only the second episode ever. So it's a brand new show. We're still, I'm still, well, I'm the, the host of the show. Eric is my guest right now. Unfortunately, you guys missed Jennifer Hadi, but you will be able uh, to replay uh, the show uh, in the VOD. And we're just discussing the, the US champs. So it, I would have loved to actually see Penguin uh, in the event. Yeah, did he, he didn't play the US Junior, did he? I, I don't think he did. Yeah, maybe there is some conflict, but um, yeah, someday it would be really cool to, to see him play. Um, he's been one of the... Uh, like star players these days online. Yeah. I, I was actually watching a stream a few hours ago. He was having uh, some intense bullet match against Ferugia. <laughs> so it's super fun to watch. I also, actually, I have to admit these days, the, uh, he's too old. I don't know if he's joking. Ooh. He's saying he's too old for the, the juniors. I think that's actually truthful. <laughs> if he uh, he's in himself, college. Probably. Yeah, he used to be younger, but now he, <laughs> he got old, man. Well, I'm sure we'll see him in the, in the, what is, what is it even called? Just the Open. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, someday. Sure. I mean, it's, it's still, it's competitive to get in. There's a lot of strong grandmasters that don't qualify, but I think he still has a lot of potential to, to improve and um, prove himself at the highest levels. For sure. And uh, yeah, I just want to say before we come back to what you're saying, when the rain can in, I really, I'm, I feel like these days there's so much going on on, on Twitch, which says that sometimes I feel like oh, I don't want to watch another stream, but <laughs> sometimes I do tune in to those big, you know, Penguin versus Ali Reza or whoever it is he's playing in Hyper Bullet. So yeah, big shout out and thanks. Thanks for the raid, Penguin. And then now I'll let you come back. You were just talking about all the players uh, and how there were some, you know, a lot of uh, new names, I think, as well this year competing for the in the US Gems. Yeah, no, across all the, um, I guess, the different tournaments between the seniors, the girls, uh, um, the juniors. Um, I mean, a lot of the players uh, treat it as a learning experience. And I mean, even, even if you're not in the running for first place, you can still play a lot of uh, a lot of like very important games there's, there's a ton of money on the line uh, I mean we should note how generous it was for the, the St. Louis Chess Club of course Jeannie and Rex to, to still sponsor the event 
with like the same prizes as they would if it were over the board. Which is incredible, yeah. And I know Wesley uh, mentioned this in his, his Facebook post. I'll bring it up in a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, e like even though there's a lot of money on the line, it's still, uh, it's still a learning experience for a lot of the players. And I'm sure uh, a lot of the players who played will have uh, opportunities to compete in the future, um, especially when uh, when we go back to over the board chess. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I I've ha I think it's gonna be so interesting to see when we come back. You know who has been working because so many. I know a lot of the young players are working so hard, and it will be interesting. I think. To, do you think we will see some big jumps in playing strength, especially uh, among the young players? It'll be interesting. Yeah, I mean. Especially given the situation over the last uh, many months, I think a lot of the young players are getting good, but their rating isn't really changing because they're not playing rated events. So it'll be really interesting like when over-the-board tournaments become more regular again. Uh, perhaps a lot of these junior players will be much underrated if they're improving while not, uh, not gaining rating. So... I'm a little bit nervous about that because I don't know how much I've improved since uh, last How much last have you month. been working on your chess during the pandemic? So I've been focused a lot more on uh, kind of streaming and making educational content. Um, but I still, so the, the times that I, I still study chess are when I have like an organized match coming up where I know who I'll be playing against. And then I'll do very specific opening preparation for that opponent. I'll do some tactics training. Um, a lot of the times I'll do this off stream because I don't want to reveal any any secret prep. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I usually I'll only study when there's like clear purpose and motivation to uh, to study. It's something I can sadly relate to, but then I only play about one match a year, so unfortunately, uh -huh. it's not a lot of not a lot of work. Um, one last question for you regarding the Hikaru Street, uh, the Hikaru tweet, which uh, I think is so funny, even just visually, how it compares to what Wesley So uh, wrote on wrote on Facebook. He wrote a lot of words. I'm not gonna read it all out, but. Uh, for Hikaru, who's now, you know, by far the biggest chess streamer on Twitch, and of course the whole tournament was being broadcast uh, on his channel uh, with com commentary by Levy Wasman and Anna Rudolph. Do you think uh, that this applies any pressure on Hikaru? Do you feel he? F do you think he feels the pressure that there's some expectations from his fans, or do you think? Uh, he is not bothered by that at all, or on the contrary, that it gives him extra motivation. Oh, you're asking if there's more pressure on him to like yeah. perform in these over the board events. I think yeah, I, I would the say US so. Championships because he's like the US mm. Golden Boy on on Twitch. Let's say I don't know how you want to put it. Yeah, I'm trying to remember if he's addressed this. I, I feel like he has, and um, I, I think it actually like it sometimes makes you play better. Of, of course, like months ago when he was having these uh, these showdowns with Magnus, he was in just very, very good form. And this was kind of at the peak of uh, just his his booming on uh, on Twitch. Um, and, and definitely when there's a lot more people watching, then of course there's more pressure, but then there's also more motivation to mm -hmm. perform at your best. Um, so I'm not sure uh, maybe what changed with the U.S. championship. Maybe he was just in bad form. But... Um, it is definitely nice when there's like a huge kind of fan base behind you cheering for you to do well. And I think it, it adds some, it does add some pressure, but it adds more motivation too. Yeah. I guess we'll see some more Hikaru big, big um, showdowns, uh, hopefully one against Magnus in the upcoming uh, speed championships yeah. as well. Um, so let's just quickly show these uh, Wesley. Wesley so wrote two uh, two big posts on his Facebook page. This is a fan page, so everyone uh, can like it and can find those statements. And to me, it was mostly just funny. I, I read them all. I'm not going to go into detail. You're actually the one who alerted me to them. Mm -hmm. How Hikaru just wrote this, like, you know, two <laughs> sentences. And uh, Wesley, so wholesome and really so grateful to all the opportunities that uh, were given to him. Yeah, I mean, this is what I like, like with 
with the different kind of personalities at the, at the top level. Um, they're uh, like they're, they're not afraid to kind of share uh, their their inner thoughts, and it, it definitely gives us something to uh, to talk about and discuss. Absolutely. Who sort? Who is your favorite? Who are your favorite follows um, for your chess content? Let's say on Twitter or on Facebook. Oh, um, oh, that's a tricky question. I mean, on Twitter, I think there's a very clear answer is uh, Anton Squared Me, <laughs> also known as Dan. Can't get enough of these like photoshopped, like funny video things. Yeah, it's such um, a pity he's been so busy lately, but hopefully, hopefully more will come for everyone who hasn't, who doesn't know him. Definitely check out Anton Squared Me. Yeah, no, he had a really funny one of like John Bartholomew. There's a clip of John Bartholomew making like some funny noise. And then he he edited it into like this Pillsbury Doughboy commercial. It was just a whole sequence of the Pillsbury Doughboy combined with this John Bartholomew noise. It was amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so big shout out, big shout out to Anton Squared Me. Um, and let's move on uh, before we, we close this topic of the US gems. <clears throat> so we already briefly touched upon it, how you now live uh, in St. Louis. Um, and this is a tweet of yours when you walked by the, the St. Louis Chess Club and noticed the familiar face <clears throat> on the TV. Tell us a bit about how it is to live in, in St. Louis and also pre in general um, for all those, especially non-Americans among the, the viewers who are not quite who don't quite realize maybe everything that's going on in St. Louis. Oh yeah, it's it's been great. I mean, St. Louis is, um, I mean, such a great hub for chess, and there's there's so many strong players that live in the city and the kind of the surrounding suburbs. Um, I mean, there's uh, at least three or four different colleges and universities that are recruiting chess players uh, between SLU, Webster. There's um, uh, I think Lindenwood is still having chess players, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of strong players in the area. And I'm probably not even within the top 20 to 30 players that, that are living in St. Louis. Um, so uh, from time to time, I'll, I'll just be taking a walk and, and, and run into someone. Um, but uh, yeah, it was definitely nicer, I guess, pre-pandemic when when there were like in-person events. Uh, I guess the last last couple events I, I helped out at were, uh, were during the candidates coverage um, in kind of mid-March, uh, at least the first half of the event. And then before that, there was Karen's Cup. Mm -hmm. uh, it was super cool to just uh, like walk over to the club and, and help out with uh, photography and, and reporting. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it uh, when it returns. Um, but yeah, the, the area is super nice with the chess club and every, like there's so many things walking distance, so I don't need to to drive too often. Yeah, sounds really awesome. So tell us when the pandemic, fingers crossed, uh, things will calm down or uh, so when normal life returns, when people travel to St. Louis and so there is the chess club and I think there's the diner, but what, how mm -hmm. can people, what is it actually like, um, the experience and when they get there, you know, the, the chess club, can you maybe describe you know what what is going on uh, around around the club oh sure well i'm i should first say that the club is planning to expand they already bought like the two or three neighboring restaurants wow. and i think they're beginning the process of renovation and i think it should be done within the next year or so no it kind of, kind of got delayed um, but they're basically tripling in size and they were already so, quite big to start with, yeah? Yeah, I mean, they, they already had, the, uh, I mean, the main club space, which is two stories. They, they have the Kingside Diner next door, which has a nice classroom space. Um, and, of course, the World Chess Hall of Fame, like the giant king is sitting outside. Um, so when, when you visit, there, there's a lot of things to, uh, to do. Um, and, and for those interested in visiting St. Louis, I, I definitely recommend visit during... Uh, a, a top event because then that's when there's more of activities for um, for fans and spectators. Um, Very nice. But yeah, it's super exciting to. Uh, exactly. Yeah, and I, I should mention. Um, I don't think this was so well promoted, 
But in the beginning of their opening ceremony broadcast on YouTube, Mm -hmm. they actually shared some like 3D renderings of what the new space will look like. Um, And it's super cool. Like they they had this whole like virtual tour. Uh, So if if anyone wants to look up like 2020 U.S. championship opening ceremony, uh, it's somewhere in that YouTube video. Absolutely. I'll try to also put the link in the description of the, the YouTube video tomorrow. Um, so yeah, for sure, something to check out. One final question about St. Louis. You mentioned before the raid that you sometimes uh, meet Ray Robson to play uh, to play mm-hmm. tennis. Um, what about all the other? You said there's so many players, uh, chess players, strong chess players living in St. Louis. Do they often get together, or do people mostly do their thing or just sort of hang out in their small crews? So unfortunately, um, I really haven't been seeing people in like, a, I guess, an inside setting basically since March. Uh, I, I meet a lot with Ray because mm-hmm. tennis is like the best uh, sport when it comes to social distancing. Um, and we, we like we each have our own kind of separate tennis ball. So we're, we're, we're super safe about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, pre pandemic there, there'd be like very regular kind of meetings and kind of gatherings of chess players, um, especially during the big events, um, like Karen's cup, uh, Yasser had some, I think like bug house gathering after, uh, after the tournament finished. Um, so that was probably the last one I, I can remember, but, uh, chess parties are the best parties. Yeah. Yeah. It's just another reason to, uh, to come to St. Louis during these big events. Absolutely. I'm sure try and, and make my way there at last. And so should everyone else who hasn't been. Eric, now let's talk about the Twitch boom. Sure. Um, so I've pulled up the, the cover of the Chess Life uh, mm. magazine, uh, which you wrote the main piece for. Uh, and so the the cover said the new chess boom. I think it was such a cool cover. And then you wrote a piece on chess streamers taking over Twitch. Um, so it's a long article. I read it all a great article. But for those who haven't read it, can you maybe give us a short rundown of everything and your experience of this Twitch boom? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it covers kind of the the months leading up to I guess April through June, where chess kind of just took off on Twitch. A lot of main main uh, stream, what do I call it? Mainstream streamers. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of the, the biggest streamers on on Twitch were streaming chess, uh, including XQC, Forsen, Boxbox. A lot of people who are known for kind of these more popular video games like Fortnite or League of Legends, or just like big variety streamers um, were playing chess, and. Uh, yeah, I, I've um, I, I delved into a lot of different aspects. Um, it's an eight-page article. I mean, I start kind of comparing it to the the Fisher boom, yeah. um, which is maybe the last time chess really took off uh, in in the mainstream, and um, also ha- touched on uh, on Pog Champs, which is kind of the culminating event with all these uh, these big streamers uh, competing against each other. Uh, created a lot of uh, a lot of cool entertainment. And um, also shared some personal perspective for uh, just advice on how to uh, start a Twitch channel and uh, and grow on Twitch. We t- we can talk a bit more about that in a second. Just you mentioned the the pop jams. Um, I thought it was a brilliant event, and I thought it mm-hmm. was so good for bringing so many new people to chess. Um, but I know some people had mixed feelings about the event. What what were your thoughts at the time and what are your thoughts looking back now? Are they the same that they were at the time? Yeah, I know it, it received some criticism given that it's just so out of the ordinary and, and gave a spotlight to uh, a lot of like beginner, beginner chess players. Um, but I think overall, like it was, it was great that uh, Chess.com was just ex- experimenting with a, a new sort of format, and it definitely reached a much much broader audience. And um, I'm almost positive that the viewership on PogChamps was bigger than the viewership from the 2018 World Championship, at least yeah. on Twitch for the Chess.com channel. 
Um, and it just reached such a, a larger audience because every competitor had their own fan base. Um, and it introduced a lot of players to the game. And even though I wasn't directly involved with it, I had a lot of new people kind of uh, discovering my stream just through getting into to chess. So I, I think it had um, a very great impact. Um, I know since kind of since a boom in, in June and July, it's um, maybe died down a little bit on Twitch with not as many extremers streaming it. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about that, actually, because so the article came out, uh, yeah, June, July, sometime in, in early summer. And I August think, 1st, yeah. Yeah, August 1st, sorry, yeah. So I think we all in the months leading up to that felt, you know, the high of the wave. And uh, what do you think happened after that? Um, because it felt there was, I don't know if calling it a slump is too harsh, but for sure what comes up must come down. Uh, so how did you see what happened in, let's say, the last two, three months? Yeah, and there's there's definitely different perspectives on it. I mean, uh, I think it was expected that there, like the the amount of viewership that existed in the like, early summer months was not going to be sustainable. But um, I mean, there's still a, a very dedicated community to chess, and there, there's still new viewers coming in all the time. I think we're like over the last couple of weeks, we're actually seeing. A, a mini boom with the uh, with this Queen's Gambit film on Netflix. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've just seen this with my own stats uh, on YouTube. Like a couple of weeks ago, I was averaging maybe hundred hundred thousand views a day, mm -hmm. but over last week, I've been averaging like two hundred fifty thousand views a day. That's a and I think that's partly difference. due to yeah. I think I think it's just due to more people searching chess, uh, given that this Queen's Gambit film is. Um, is like one of the top things to watch right now on Netflix. I think the top. I think it made number hit number one in at least twenty seven countries, and uh, that, yeah. yeah, which is astonishing. And I've pulled up another tweet by by Maurice, which uh, I think that tweet is just from a couple of days ago, or maybe even yesterday. And uh, he said, "Breaking news: CBS Sunday Morning will air a piece about the explosive chess boom that we chess fans are all enjoying right now, with Queen's Gambit soaring on Netflix, and critical thinking getting rave reviews. It's a nice time to be a chess player. Uh, so indeed, we are, I think, riding the a new wave now." What? Yeah, no, I was going to mention the the CBS piece because I, I woke up this morning and I was getting messages from. Uh, like family friends who don't even know about chess, like saying that they, they saw me in a few second clip in that uh, that CBS uh, piece. So okay, it was see, super I cool. I should have found that. <laughs> I don't know if I could, but if people have a way to check it out. So what was the what what, what did they uh, talk? What did they show uh, on the sh on the Sunday morning show? Oh yeah, it was like a four or five minute segment. Um, I mean, the, the the two main kind of interviews were with Maurice Ashley. And Alexandra Botez, mm -hmm. who they're, like they're just such great ambassadors for uh, for the sports, um, and they they did they had a lot of B roll footage of like what you see on Twitch. Uh, they had some footage of like Washington Square Park and kind of comparing the over over the board scene to the, the online scene. Um, and then I I was featured for a few seconds in like this. Uh, there was this popular clip uh, from one of Chess.com's. Uh, I am not a GM speed chess championship mm -hmm. where I got stalemated. Yeah, <laughs> I saw that one. Yeah, so um, yeah, so it was, it was great, and it, it kind of showed the the entertaining aspect of chess, and they kind of made the point at the beginning that chess is kind of stereotypically not the most exciting thing to watch, but then once you get into it, you realize there, there's a lot of a uh, lot of entertainment value, and there's like a whole community surrounding it so it's definitely good coverage screws in the chat wants to know has elizabeth forgiven you for the stalemate ah yeah so i know she was like she was definitely upset in the moment <laughs> um you're not so happy in the post game interview but then like a, a week or two later there is a clip on one of her streams where she like she somehow survived a dead loss position and then afterwards, she was saying, like, Eric Rosen is my hero. Um, if it wasn't for him, I would have resigned in this position. So I'll have to dig up that clip. That's very funny. 
Um, and before we end this topic, so I've talked about it with Jen quite a bit already, but have you uh, have you seen the Queen's Gambit? And if so, what did you make of it? Yeah, no, I um, I binged through the whole thing in a few days. Um, and it was really well done. Um, I mean, midway through the, the series, I found out that uh, Bruce Pandolfini and Gasparov were working as a, the chess consultants. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking to myself, like after watching the first few episodes, whoever was helping with the, the chess did like a really, really good job. Because yeah. um, there, there were a lot of, uh, I mean, there was a lot of attention to detail in kind of the positions that arose when she was first winning the game and then these these more like serious games. So that, that's very much appreciated as like a, a strong player Especially when there's so many movies that just mess up a lot of uh, a lot of the, the intricate chess positions. So exactly. it was nice to see. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, really, really nice to... Well, I also only found out after a while um, that, you know, Kasparov and then Pandolfini, and of course Pandolfini also had a, a cameo appearance in the, in the series. Yeah, no, I've um, that was a pleasant surprise uh, towards the end because um, I, I know he also had a, a cameo in Searching for Bobby Fischer mm -hmm. as well, and there's definitely some overlap uh, between those uh, those two films. Where does uh, the Queen's Gambit rank for you in terms of uh, movies or series made made about chess? Um, it's definitely up there. I mean, first of all, there's not too much like too many mainstream chess movies to begin with um but I, I definitely saw uh some overlap with searching for bobby fisher um but it has to be in a, like at least top three if not like the best kind of film or series that's ever been made good yeah i i agree with you i still think that for us chess players i don't know how much uh you will agree with that i still think that although it's made so well and the chess scenes are so well researched and the games i can never help but cringe a tiny bit with some of the chess scenes but do you think that's just normal for us chess players that some of the scenes are like uh yeah there are some moments like the like the chatter during an actual game like you really <laughs> really never see in uh in in, in real life tournament play yeah. um but then i i think there are some parts also uh given that it was held in like the, the 1960s mm -hmm. that I'm not entirely sure what the culture was like <laughs> was back then. So um, maybe that's how they behaved, but I, I don't really know. But I know. Uh, also for me as a woman player, the, when the one game when the guy resigned and he kissed her hand, I was like, okay, was that <laughs> it's a bit weird. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Like, I think these days there would be an uproar if something like that were to happen. Uh, but Eric, time time is flying. Uh, let's lastly bring up, we've discussed Twitch, we've discussed the US Champs, um, we've discussed all of that, but let's talk about your YouTube channel because I guess that is one of the things that has been keeping you most busy during this pandemic. Is that correct? Uh, definitely. Yeah, I probably, um, I mean, a lot of my day is, uh, is dedicated to streaming and then to editing content and then designing thumbnails. And I mean, for the last several months, I've been trying to turn out uh, a video every day. So definitely takes a lot of energy, but, um, it's been very rewarding and, uh, the audience has been, uh, pretty consistently growing over last, uh, last couple of years. You have, a uh amassed a huge uh, following by now. What do you think is the key to success behind behind your channel? Um, there, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, I mean, consistency, I think, is is very, very important if, if you're trying to grow an audience online where, um, especially with videos, you, you want to produce um, at least a few, a few a week to keep people coming back. Um, it's also helped to kind of have the balance between Twitch and YouTube, mm -hmm. where I'll do um, a several hour stream on Twitch and then repurpose some of the best content from the live streams for YouTube content. And I'm kind of able to kill uh, a few birds with one stone in, in that regard. 
And um, I mean, it's very rare that I, I like pre-record or plan out a YouTube video. Like a lot of my content is kind of spur of the moment, um, kind of uh, things that happen on on Twitch. And I, I try and uh, play a lot of like interesting, aggressive openings. Try and provide some educational value. So um, yeah, very, and I'm trying to keep experimenting as well. That's very interesting to me that most of the the YouTube content isn't pre-planned, but sort of you know derives from the uh, the streams. But then my question is, your thumbnail game for me is the best on. Uh, on YouTube and correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I'm aware, you do uh, all of these yourself. The yes, yeah, I, I do. Um, I, I do all my thumbnails. Sometimes I'll spend I'll spend a, a lot of time uh, putting thought and uh, and energy into into designing these thumbnails in, in Photoshop. Um, but I, I do kind of have a background in, uh, I mean, of, of course, photography, but also kind of Photoshop and, um, and graphic design. I so actually, I did a lot of, a lot of things in college. Yeah, go ahead. I actually, I, uh, I tried to read up your Vicky before the, the show and mm. I couldn't find an English, but I found a German Vicky mm. article. <laughs> there, there's a funny story behind that. Uh, some some people tried to make a Wikipedia page for me in English, uh -huh. but then one of the moderators like kind of they put it up for deletion, and then there is this whole debate on whether or not I'm notable enough, <laughs> and then people couldn't they couldn't uh, prove that I'm notable enough to have a Wikipedia page, so then it just kind of got deleted. However, the whole forum, the whole conversation of whether I'm not notable enough, it, it's still there and you can read through it. It's, it's a fun, funny read. But I'm notable enough in Germany for some reason. You should get here all your fans, all the, the Twitch and all the YouTube people. <laughs> we should all get on the case and get your, get your wiki page back up. But yeah, so on the German page, I read that you have a bachelor in interactive digital media. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. I um I graduated graduated from Webster uh, in 2017, and it was a great major. It, it kind of encompassed uh, all the things I'm interested in between web design, photography, graphic design, video production, and it combined very well with uh, with chess. Yeah, because I think it's so interesting. I guess you're the only. Do you also edit the videos yourself, or do you have an editor who helps with that? No, I, I don't actually outsource any work. And I probably should these days because my like my schedule is getting a lot busier. I was wondering how do you find the time because as a fellow uh, streamer, I don't even do YouTube, but I'm like, how do you find the time to do everything? The videos, the thumbnails. I know so much time goes into them. How do you do it? Yeah, it, it's honestly tough, and there, there's been some times over the last few months where I've just been burnt out, and I like I need to take a break from streaming for for a few days or even a week. Mm -hmm. um, I try and do like practice batching, where I'll just I'll dedicate a few hours, like do do a bunch of videos, where I'll, I'll edit, export, upload, and then um, on a different day uh, do the thumbnails and then schedule ahead of time. Um, for the editing, it's actually not too difficult because a lot of my videos, I just have to pick a start and end point. Mm -hmm. But it still takes time to figure out kind of the content I want to post on YouTube and the, the title thumbnail combination. Um, so recently, I actually got uh, office space, just designated office space uh, in a building not too far away. And that's been a huge help of, of having just a, a simple space where I can go and be more productive rather than working for my apartment. Yeah, that's, I think, great advice. And uh, I now just have one final question. So first of all, before I remove this slide, of course, everyone who isn't following Eric yet should make sure to follow him at Eric Rosen on YouTube. And uh, I saw that uh, just a few days ago, this video that you posted less than three months ago just hit one million views. Uh, this one is just a tweet, but people should follow you on Twitter as well. There's some uh, outtake videos of your, your videos and your clips, and they're so funny. So what do you think is the secret to those uh, two videos that are going to, you know, get these big numbers like over a million views? 
what have you learned over time yeah that's um that's a good question and there's um i mean it's hard to actually produce viral content because mm -hmm. uh, very often the YouTube algorithm will, will push certain videos that perform well. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've spent probably the last several months trying to better understand the YouTube algorithm and, and what kind of goes into making a video that will ultimately get a lot of views. Um, so it really helps to have a video that that offers value to people that people will watch the whole way through. Um, and if, uh, if a video has like good watch time and good viewer retention, then YouTube will usually push it to just a broader audience. Um, and this specific video that you mentioned, I think it's called beating everyone with the with same, the same opening, opening trap. trap yeah. Um, and this is just a, a kind of topic within chess that just gets more viewership in general is opening people traps. Love traps. <laughs> yeah, because uh, like the majority of people watching chess on YouTube are beginners and that they're looking to take away just some very concrete lessons. Mm -hmm. um, and opening traps are great where I, I, I can show um, show some clips of me using the using this opening trap and then they can do it in their own games. So um, yeah, over yeah, last uh, last week, this video has been getting like 50,000 views a day. So. The uh, algorithm has been effects perfect. again, or yeah, yeah. I think uh, people are maybe searching for chess, and this is one of the the videos that's uh, that's popping up first on their feeds. Very nice, Eric. Before we move on to the the quick fire questions, hopefully you haven't pre prepared all your answers. So I was watching the one with Jen, and I was super nervous. So I like I don't know if you're going to ask me the same questions, Actually, but unfortunately, uh... I am. Ah, okay. Hopefully you don't remember them all. And uh, just one final question, just about uh, YouTube. If there's someone watching who wants to start their own Twitch or their own YouTube or both, what would sort of be your main advice uh, for someone who's just starting out uh, in that scene? Um, yeah, I, I mean, this is a topic I can probably spend hours uh, discussing. <laughs> but I'll, I'll first say the hardest part is starting. I wanted to start a Twitch channel and YouTube channel maybe two or three years before I actually started. And sometimes it's about just getting out of your comfort zone, starting very minimal, just use a laptop, built-in webcam. You don't have to invest in too much equipment these days to, to start. And then, then it's about doing what you enjoy and then trying to provide value. And if you're providing uh, educational or entertainment value, then... Um, and hopefully an audience will come and it should really start out as a passion before you really try and turn it into any sort of career or um, or side hustle. Are you still passionate after all these years? I am. Yeah, no, I, I constantly try and, and find things that I enjoy that will also appeal to the, the viewers. And that's a really important aspect uh, to to what I do. And I'm super grateful that I can kind of make a uh, a career out of my passion. So yeah, if I wasn't passionate ab about it, then maybe I would move on to something else, but yeah. I'm still enjoying it these days. That's great to hear. And I think we're very fortunate to be able to do um, what we are doing, but time has been, it's been such an in interesting discussion. So let's, without too much further ado, let's move on to the quick fire questions. I know you've heard mm. most. So first the non chess related ones. Um, so I'll start with what do you think is your best quality? Oh dear, I, I heard you ask this one to Jen and then I couldn't, I, I was trying to think and I was, ah, I'm having mental block. Um, I guess the ability to appear calm under pressure and not to rage <laughs> and break anything. Even though sometimes I'll, like, internally I'll get upset, but... I, I like, especially from streaming, I'll try and um, be a good role model to people. <laughs> There's a comment in the chat saying his best quality is his soothing voice. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, there's some people, I, I get comments from time to time, people that don't really understand chess, but just like listening to my, my content or even fall asleep to listening to my content. So. <laughs> nice. What is the last book you have read? Oh, um, ooh. So I I don't really read books. 
but I, I listen to audiobooks. Mm -hmm. So what's the and, best audiobook? Yeah. Um, oh, I, I have a story. It's not the most recent one, but it is one I, I listened to in the last year. It's a romance novel mm -hmm. that I'm mentioned in. And right. it's about a chess player. And it was, it's, it was super random, but a few years ago, there was a family friend that like bought a book from this uh, this store and then saw me like mentioned in the the dedication page. That is so random. Um, and I had completely forgot about it, but back in like 2013 or 2014, this author reached out to me. She's a, a romance writer, mm -hmm. and she was writing a story about a chess player from the University of Illinois, which I was attending at the time. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to interview me about what it's like kind of being on a, a college chess team. Um, so it, it's an interesting story. And there, there's a character in the book named Eric. Um, so and it's on all. That. I listened to it. Yeah, it's, it's probably not the most like kid friendly book. <laughs> um, but it's an interesting read. And there's definitely some overlap between the book and this Queen's Gambit show. So do you know the name of the book? Oh, yeah, it's know? called The Girl He Used to Know. Used it's to know. by Tracy Garvis Graves. Excellent. I will definitely, definitely look it up. Uh, a different question. If you could be an animal, what would you be? Oh, this one I prepared, a walrus. <laughs> so there's a walrus gambit, and anytime I play it, I have to pretend that I'm a walrus. <laughs> so people and... can search it on YouTube. <laughs> I like your the prep work has uh, paid off. And yeah. <laughs> which superpower would you like to have? Oh, this one I forgot about. Um, probably time travel, or or just the ability to play blindfold like Timur Gurev. Speaking I don't know. of time travel, if you had a time machine, where and when would we go? Ooh, uh, probably, I don't know, whenever a vaccine is made, maybe a year from now, <laughs> or maybe future. six months from now, and probably, where would I go, maybe to Iceland, oh, to or Vietnam, to Japan, at last. yeah, Vietnam, get some soup. <laughs> Speaking of soup, what is the strangest thing you have ever eaten? Ooh, I've traveled a lot to uh, like these Asian countries. But I usually just get like noodles or like coconuts, so it's not so strange. But when I was when I was three years old, I tried eating my sock, and it wasn't very edible. You suck. <laughs> That's probably the number one thing. I think we'll take that as an answer. <laughs> Which three people, dead or alive, would you invite to dinner? Ooh. Um. Dead or alive. Well, probably Gordon Ramsay. Mm -hmm. Make him cook the dinner. And then Gandhi. Uh -huh. And Beth Harmon. That Even though she, maybe she's fix, fictional, it would still be cool. That's fine. That would be one interesting. So tonight we had some two, two very interesting dinner parties where were cooked up by you guys. And uh, the next question is easier. Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram? Ooh, um, probably Twitter. Yeah, I, I, so I need to be more active on Instagram, but I've, I've been more active on Twitter lately. I just hit 10,000 followers on Twitter, too, oh, like a few nice. hours ago. So I have to sell it. Thanks actually, so much. I just thought up a new question. Uh, Twitch or YouTube? YouTube. Even though Twitch is really fun, YouTube just has a bigger audience and there's more discovery potential. But I I've, I've still enjoy both. Mm -hmm. And describe yourself in three words. Ooh. Uh, I am Rosen. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite movie? Hmm. I really liked Brooklyn Castle, mm -hmm. this documentary on IS 318. Um, either that or Searching for a Bobby Fisher. Chess movie, interesting. Uh, your favorite song? Ooh, uh, Hall of the Mountain King. 
Your it's favorite. like an old copyright free, but I, I I like to play it when I play bullet chess. Is it like upbeat or calm? It's one of like these classical pieces. You would know it if you if you listen to it, and it's like super intense towards the end, and it just gets me in the zone whenever I, the time I play chess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what's your what was your favorite subject in school? Photography. And what's your favorite sport besides chess? Definitely tennis. That's like the only other thing I'm I'm playing these days. But maybe ping pong would be a close second. Both are very good. What's your favorite food? Mm. Uh, Pad Thai. Anything Thai food is so good. I'm with you. And your favorite drink? Oh, I just had my favorite drink. I have it. It's gone, but the cup is still here. I don't know if you can see it. It's a London Fog tea latte. I've never even heard of that. So it's uh, it's like steamed milk with Earl Grey tea. Yeah. And they put a little bit of like nice syrup. And Starbucks makes it. But it's also named for my favorite opening too. So London. it's nice. Is, is that an English drink? Like I've never heard of that. Is that an English? Surely it's not an American thing. I think I don't know. I don't know the history of it, but um, it might be a Starbucks creation. <laughs> I should know, but it's it's tasty. Zavulon in the chat does not look impressed. By the way, guys, we let Eric go, and the show will be over in just uh, two three minutes from now. So if you have any questions for Eric, now is your chance to let me know in the chat uh, while we move to the chess-related quick fire questions. So my first question is, which opening will you never play? Mm. I, I like to experiment with like every opening imaginable. So, man, that's a tough, that's a tough question. Actually, I forgot to say you get one pass, but there is still a trick question coming up. So oh, maybe dear. you want to save your pass. I'll, probably some one of those like theoretical lines in the night or maybe the poison pawn in night or where if like if you don't know. 50 moves of theory, then you're just lost. So I like it scares that. me. I like that answer. Um, which chess player would you take with you on a desert island? Ooh. Uh, can I say Beth Harmon again? <laughs> sure. <laughs> and who would or, you? Or, no, actually, there, there's another answer. Uh, Spencer Bledsoe, <laughs> who was on the is. TV show Survivor. He's like an expert player, but he almost won the season. Like uh, Sam, was that the same show he, he was on or no? Oh, it was Sam a different... Shanklin. Sam Shanklin was on a different like Survivor-like show. But yeah, <laughs> but pro probably not But you think this guy would do a better job than Sam? Yeah, Sam got voted out like the first or second episode. <laughs> so maybe Sam is a better pick for who would you not want to be stranded with on a desert island? Oh, I mean, he's still like... A decent human <laughs> and he could probably teach me a thing or two about chess yeah I'd probably have to pass or maybe I would just pick like what did Jen say alpha zero she or said, stockfish uh, she, <laughs> I think she I think she jokingly said Greg oh yeah I think Greg is tolerable <laughs> yeah probably like alpha zero or stockfish <laughs> Who is your, uh, who is your favorite world champion? It's got to be Magnus. And your favorite time control, classical, rapid, blitz, or bullet? Hmm. Uh, probably blitz or bullet. I, I, I like playing bullet just off stream, but usually on stream, I, I prefer blitz. It gives me time to talk. Interesting. So yeah. one of those. Bullet is a nice way to wind down i find sometimes mm -hmm. um what would you be if not a if not a chess player mm, probably a photographer uh maybe a chess photographer i don't know <laughs> or i mean when you say chess player uh well you because you mean because you're kind of a content creator if you yeah had, I'm if kind you of, had nothing yeah. to do with chess so it. probably a national geographic photographer because I like taking photos of animals, like to go to like the Arctic and just follow penguins around. 
And once again, since people actually, uh, all those who were not here before the raid, if you aren't following Eric yet on Instagram, go and do it now. Um, and finally, what would you name your opening if you invented one? Mm. So there's an opening that exists that's called the Rosen Attack. That's named after a player from like the 1900s. I was trying to find some like relationship going back in my genealogy. So if, like Rosen Attack is already taken. So you'd have to go for I don't know. else. Maybe, yeah. That's, that's a tough one. I, I have an endgame trap, uh, the, the Rosen Stalemate Trap. <laughs> Um, but I'll, I'll have to get back to you when it comes to an opening game. <laughs> we'll add your answer in the YouTube description below when, mm. you, when you come up with one. Eric, that's all from me uh, from the, the quickfire questions. I saw there were a couple of prep sh questions in the, um, in the YouTube chat. So Shang, Sh uh, Shashank wants to know, uh, Eric, knowing how much you love gambits, what... Gambit, would you play against Magnus and would you berserk? Oh, so that's probably a situation where it's bullet chess. Like the only time I play him is in these like bullet title arenas. Um, I would probably only berserk if he berserks, <laughs> just to keep it kind of level. Um, I, I looked up his games in the Stafford Gambit mm -hmm. and he just completely crushes the Stafford Gambit. Um, Actually, so I'd probably I found play I don't on, know. Your, on yeah. your wiki. It says on your German Wikipedia page, it says that you have beaten Magnus twice. Yeah, no, I have a I have a plus score against him in these Lee Chess title arenas. <laughs> um, so I, I did play. Actually, I, I beat him with the Budapest Gambit, nice. uh, our first our first game together. But I played him unknowingly, and he pre he pre moved some moves, so he didn't accept the Gambit. Um, so maybe I would play like the Halloween Gambit against him. It would be would very be fitting. Appropriate. Yeah. Eric, uh, I've, I know we've gone uh, way over time already, but there is no some, worries. some very interesting uh, topics in there. It's always a pleasure uh, for me uh, having you on any stream, um, any show. Uh, thank you so very much for your time, people. Remember to uh, subscribe to Eric's YouTube channel, to his Twitch, his Twitter, his Instagram, everywhere. Uh, and yeah, thank you so, so much. Uh, it's been great and I'm sure we'll be seeing plenty more of you in the near future. Thanks so much. Yeah, this has been really fun. Well, uh, happy to stay in touch. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Eric. Have a good night. Thanks, you too. And, and to everyone in chat, hope you have a good night or a good bishop. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Eric. Okay, so that concludes uh, week two of last Jazz Week tonight. I don't know where time has gone. I was going to I was gonna uh, stick to an hour 30 for the show. But uh, we had so many interesting uh, topics with Jennifer and later with uh, Jennifer Shahadi and with Eric Rosen. But that is all for me for now. I will be back with more next week. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, hope you enjoyed the show. Hope you got to know our guests a little bit better as well. That's all for me for now. Thank you so much uh, for watching. I'll see you all very soon. Have a good night or a good day, depending on where you are. Take care. Bye-bye.